Hi friends, my name is Annalise Jones and I teach a Book of Mormon class on Facebook, similar to an institute class for adults who just want the convenience of their own home and it's just um, something I was inspired to do so it's not formal, it's not officially called by the church. But anyway, I feel like now is the time that I want to make a video for the youth. So this video is a modification on one of my classes, class number 36. But this time, this is especially for the teenagers out there. So the chapter that I read and the talk that I read, I like to read the Book of Mormon and then correlate it to a general conference talk. And I love to collect really awesome general conference talks that open your eyes a new way and help you understand things in a different light and just really inspire you. Meaty, awesome conference talks or BYU devotional talks. And there are so many awesome talks out there. So I do want to share with them. I want to share them with you and I want to bring that to your attention. So the talk that I was looking at today is called Out of Darkness into Marvelous Light by Robert D. Hales. And I was just led to look at Helaman 5. I found Helaman 5 because I was doing, I looked up light in the index. And one of the scriptures was talking about um, Lehi saw God in a pillar of fire or something happened, but it, I had the idea to look up fire in the index. And um, there are a few stories in the Book of Mormon where somebody is surrounded by fire and fire is a protective shield which is really interesting because usually fire is a destructive thing, right? Like you don't want it. <laughs> it's not safe. Don't play with matches, guys. But in this instance, fire is the protection. And I'm in Helaman 5 today. Let me start from the beginning. I got ahead of myself. Let me tell you about this story. And if you're not familiar with this, um, I'll sum it up for you. But to get the full effect, you should probably pause this video and read Helaman chapter five and then come back. But if you wanna hear me sum it up, no worries. So I'm starting on verse 22, okay? They're already kind of into their mission here. But what happened is some people did not like the things that they were preaching. And a lot of times in the Book of Mormon, we find that the wicked taketh the truth to be hard. And they don't like being called wicked. And they get defensive and they kind of get out their big guns and they fight, which just kind of proves the fact that they're wicked, right? All right, but anyway, they put the missionaries in prison. Now, did they commit a crime? No, but apparently that's their legal system. <laughs> There's no protection for missionaries. So they are cast into prison. And after they had been cast into prison many days without food, Behold, they went forth into the prison to take them that they might slay them. So now prison's not good enough. We're just going to kill them. Why? Because they're Christian. Right? Do you need a better reason than that? Yeah. <laughs> and verse 23, when they came to take Lehi and Nephi, the sons of Helaman, and put them in prison, suddenly they were encircled about as if by fire, even insomuch that they could not lay their hands upon them for fear that they would be burned. Nevertheless, Nephi and Lehi were not burned, and they were standing in the midst of fire and were not burned. So a miracle occurred. A fire that is acting as a shield to protect the Lord's prophets. Meanwhile, it is a destructive influence for the wicked. They were, they were afraid of it. If they reached forth, it would hurt them, right? And when they saw that they were encircled about with the pillar of fire, that it burned them not, their hearts did take courage. Nephi and Lehi, they suddenly found new courage. A miracle is taking place before them, and I imagine that would give you a nice spring in your step, right? Uh, what I think about that in, in that verse, um, did they have to be surrounded with fire in order to have courage? Why do we sometimes make God go to great lengths to demonstrate that he loves us? We can't just take him at his word. We can't just trust that he loves us. We can't trust that he's there for us. You know, sometimes sometimes we don't want to believe it and we make him prove it to us. <laughs> and now they are struck dumb with amazement 
And Lehi and Nephi stood forth and said, Fear not, for behold, it is God that has shown unto you this marvelous thing. So the people were struck dumb with amazement because they're encircled about by fire and they're not burning up. And they said, well, this is the work of God. So now they're using it as a missionary tool. And just then, darkness comes, a cloud of darkness, and the earth shakes. And so God is really showing forth his power here. So what I wanted to point out here is that when God shows forth his power by shaking the earth and by turning off all the lights, now that's kind of scary, right? So it looks like God is this scary person. And he's doing a favor for those two guys, sure. But does he love the other guys? Or are they his children? I'm, I'm thinking that they think no. They're thinking that God is this big, scary person. So what does God do now to show them that he's not scary, that he does love them? In verse 30, his voice comes. It was a still voice of perfect mildness, as if it had been a whisper and it did pierce them even to the very soul. And so now let's take a quick jump over to 3 Nephi chapter 11. And this is when they hear the voice of the Lord later on, the Nephites hear the voice of the Lord introducing Jesus Christ. And it came to pass that while they were thus conversing one with another, they heard a voice as if it came out of heaven. And they cast their eyes round about, for they understood not the voice which they heard. And it was not a harsh voice, neither was it a loud voice. Nevertheless, and notwithstanding it being a small voice, it did pierce them that did hear to the center, insomuch that there was no part of their frame that it did not cause to quake. Yea, it did pierce them to the very soul, and it did cause their hearts to burn. And it came to pass that again they heard the voice, and they understood it not. And again the third time they did hear their voice, and they did open their ears to it, and their eyes toward the sound thereof, and they did look steadfastly towards heaven from whence the voice came. And then they understood the words, and it said, Behold, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased." So those are the two parts in the Book of Mormon where the voice of God is heard. And in both parts, in 3 Nephi chapter 11, verse 3, and in Helaman chapter 5, verse 30, it describes it as like this quiet whisper, like an intense, gentle, tender whisper. And it did pierce them to the very center and it caused their frame to quake. Really? A whisper can do that? Can you imagine that? Have you ever felt the Holy Ghost where suddenly it just comes over you and you might feel goosebumps? You might feel like crying. You might just suddenly feel warm. One time I was talking with my friend about my relationship with the Savior. And as I was talking to her, suddenly I was laying on my couch on the phone and it literally felt like a warm blanket was just put over me and I just felt so cozy and warm. It was a, It's the only time in my life, the only time ever that I felt this feeling like a blanket was on me. And it felt so sweet. It just felt like I was a little baby in my mother's arms. And that was a love of my savior. And that was an amazing experience that I felt a tangible feeling of being wrapped up in my savior's arms or in a cozy little blanket. And, um, that was a very special experience for me. Have you had a special experience where you have felt the spirit? Comment below and share it if you feel prompted to share it. But what do we learn from this? Now, a God who creates shields of flames and shakes the earth and causes darkness. Is, is that a scary God? Is that an intimidating God? Is that a God who loves you and knows you personally? Sometimes we get scared and intimidated. And remember how when they noticed that they weren't burning up their hearts to take courage, sometimes we need a little nudge or a little encouragement and say, look, it's okay, God's not scary, and we can take courage. And I wanted to compare this to when some of us maybe make a mistake and we do something that we're not supposed to do and we probably commit a serious sin. And then it's time to go confess to the bishop and we think that it's big and scary. We think the roof is going to collapse and our, our heart is going to stop beating. And this is very scary, 
right? And then, so we put it off and put it off. And months later, we finally go in to see the bishop. And we are shocked that he loves us. And he spoke with a voice of perfect mildness. And it wasn't scary at all. And he loves us. And we were just touched of how much compassion and understanding the bishop has for us. Sometimes we think it's scary to go into the bishop and confess a sin. And so we put it off. But what we don't realize is that he loves us. And he treats us with as much mercy as possible. And he doesn't want to shame us or humiliate us. Not at all. He will be so patient and kind as he helps us repent and work through the temptations we're facing, work through an addiction that we're facing, work through any difficult emotions that we're going through. He wants to be on your team and he wants to be your friend. So it's just like in the scriptures when the people were afraid and intimidated by this, by this frightening God. But then... When it turn, as it turns out, this God is perfectly mild and tender and he did pierce their hearts with love and he just loves them. So another thing I wanted to talk about, verse 24, again, when it said that they were encircled about with a pillar of fire and it burned them not in their hearts to take courage. This is when they looked around and they realized they were surrounded with fire. We see this again in verse 43. Uh, to continue the story, the people repented. The people asked Nephi and Lehi, what do we do? What do we do to um, lift this cloud of darkness from us? And they told them to repent. So the people cried out to God and repent and then each individual is now encircled about by a pillar of fire so they get the special fire shield too and in verse 43 it says that they cast their eyes about and they saw that they were encircled about by a pillar of fire so my question for you is what's going on around you that you can't even see if you were to cast your eyes around about, if you could see through the veil, if you could have spiritual eyes and see what's going on around you, what do you think you would see? So often we are just totally ignorant of the fact that we have spiritual protection already. We have angels standing by us and we can't see it. What if we could look about us and realize, hey, I'm surrounded by a pillar of fire here. God is an active participant in my life. And God is orchestrating my life to bless me. And God is bringing tender mercies into my life. Wow, now I can see it. And I encourage you to look around and pray that you can have eyes to see all the tender mercies in your life. Because I guarantee it, amazing things are happening in your life. Miracles are happening in your life. And you just haven't seen it yet. You haven't looked around and noticed yet. I saw a cartoon somewhere where this guy is walking down the sidewalk and he's just walking down the sidewalk like he's, he's on his way to go get a milkshake at the, at the corner shop, right? <laughs> and what he doesn't see is all around him there are demons with weapons trying to attack him, right? And then there are angels holding back the demons, protecting him. And he's just walking down the street whistling like he has no idea at all. So that's my question to you. What miracles are happening in your life on the other side of the veil or in regular life, but you just don't have eyes to see it? What if you don't even know? Too often we get caught up in our worries and our problems and the next, the next test we have to take, the next deadline or the problems at home. And if we're going to get grounded or we get in trouble for something or fighting with our sibling and we're just so caught up in the stress of life that we forget to look around us and notice the miracles of life and notice how, how God has our back and God is doing amazing things for us. And now in verse 36, uh, I don't think I told you about this part. Sorry, I kind of skipped around. Uh, this cloud of darkness comes over the Lamanites and they are afraid. And it came to pass that as they turned about, Suddenly they could see through the cloud of darkness. Why? Because they see the faces of Nephi and Lehi and they were shining exceedingly. 
So sometimes in our life, we're surrounded by darkness. We're surrounded by hopelessness. We have problems with depression and anxiety, fear, worry, and just stress, and we feel weighed down. We're looking into a bleak future. We have no idea where life is going. Have you ever felt like that? We're surrounded by darkness. And just like these people could see through the darkness when they noticed that Lehi and, and Nephi's lights, they, their, their faces were illuminated with light. I pray that when we go through our times of trouble and darkness, we can look through and notice our Savior is standing there through the darkness at the end of that tunnel and his arm is stretched forward and he is inviting us to come and be with him. And that's our Savior inviting us to walk through that darkness and go be in his arms or better yet, he will say, you hold tight, I'm coming to you. All you have to do is exercise your agency and say that you will have me and I'm coming to rescue you. He is going to walk through the darkness and come take us. But do we have the eyes to see? Do we have eyes of faith? Can we see through the darkness and notice that our savior is there wanting to come rescue us and offering his hand to save us? Now, Okay, well, there's a scripture in Isaiah, also in 2 Nephi, that talks about the same thing. And the scripture says, it's a prophecy of Christ. It says, the people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. And I want you to think about just that contrast, right? Times in your life when you have felt the most despairing, the most hopeless, where you just want to quit up, you just want to give up and quit on life, Right? Imagine walking in that darkness and then you see the light of Jesus Christ. You see a great light and it is a beacon of hope and it gives you a reason to press on and continue. It gives you hope that you can go forth in your life and there will be a solution to your problems eventually. There will be good things to come. You can be reminded of all the people who do love you or the things that are going well in your life. What blessings do you have? And have those eyes to see the beauty and the goodness all around you. And that is seeing the light in the darkness, the light that's only available because of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, now I want to take this verse and apply it another way. What is it like when we're in darkness and there's no one to lead the way? There's no one who can relate to us. Nobody's giving us any empathy. We feel totally alone, right? Now, what is it like when you look through the darkness and you can see somebody's face and you know that you're not alone? So in this case, they see the faces of Nephi and Lehi and they know that Nephi and Lehi have already been in their shoes. They've already walked through darkness. They've already been surrounded by a pillar of fire and they have the protection of God. And now these people are in the darkness and they're saying, I want what you have. I want that protection of God. How do I get what you have? So my message for you is you be the lighthouse to your friends, to other people, maybe non-members, or maybe your member friends. You know, we're not exempt. Just because we're members of the church doesn't mean we're exempt. We still need a lighthouse. We still need someone to be there for us too, right? You be the lighthouse to people. Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. When they are walking through their Gethsemane, when they're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, let them know that they're not alone, that they can look through that darkness and see your face and know that you've been there, you know what it's like, and even if you don't know what it's like, you can offer them a hug and encouragement and they're not alone. They can have a friend in you. I wanna share an experience that I went through in 2013. Um, I was a competitive runner and I was winning 5K races. I had done a few marathons and I was feeling on top of the world. I had no problems at all, right? And then suddenly my world came crashing down and I got very sick. I had to stop running and nobody was visiting me. Nobody was checking in on me. My family didn't call me. I didn't have anyone to talk to and tell them about the trouble I was going through and my, my health problem. And I felt very alone. And it continued on for months and months. And I spent many days just crying in bed because I didn't know how to fix myself. And I was alone. And what I learned through that lesson, I just learned it sucks to be alone, guys. It really sucks to be alone. And I was thinking, I don't want anyone to go through that. Nobody should have to feel the way I felt. Nobody should have to be worrying about 
their health or worrying about whatever your problem is, your finances, your grades, your family relationships, and then feel alone on top of that. That just makes everything worse, right? I mean, your problem is one thing. You can probably handle your problem, but if you're going through it all alone, that makes it 10 times worse. That's what makes you feel despairing and hopeless. I know that. I assume you feel that's a way too, but that's definitely the way I felt. And I didn't think anyone should feel like that. I wanted to be a friend and encourage people and lift them up. And it's my life's mission to inspire people and to help them find the light of Jesus Christ and to give them hugs and let them know they're not alone and to love people. And no matter what they're going through, not to judge them, but be a listening ear and to just be there for them so that they're not alone. So let your light shine before men that they might see your good works, be a lighthouse. In the talk, out of darkness into marvelous light, Elder Hales tells us that he grew up in the harbor, near the harbor of New York City, where they have lighthouses that are guiding the ships coming into the harbor. And he says, I know the danger of a fallen lighthouse. And I want you to imagine if you're steering a boat and you're watching that lighthouse to know where the shore is so that you can kind of steer and park your little car, your boat. What if the lighthouse goes out? What if it's pitch dark and you don't know exactly which way to steer, which way is land, and how close is the land. It's a very tricky, dangerous situation, and ships fall, and sailors die when there's no lighthouse. So Jesus Christ is our true light. He is your light. Reach out to him. He is there for you. But you be that light to your friends, too. So we definitely need to be there for one another, and that's what saints that's what that term saints is all about. We are a community. We are a network. We support and lift each other, right? And we need to do a better job of that. That's ministering, right? So there's another lesson I want to tell you on this topic. It's coming from this talk by Robert D. Hales. He talks about, um, he had a bicycle growing up and as you pedal, now remember this is generating motion, power, and there was a light on his bike, maybe like the reflective light that goes on when you ride your bike. But they didn't have that technology for a regular, what we have as a reflective light back then. And what he would do is as you pedal, it generates power and it illuminates that light. So I love this analogy. He says, spiritual light is the same way and it also takes consistent effort to generate that power. But here's the thing with riding a bike or it, have you ever tried this on an elliptical machine? You just stand on one of the pedals and see if you can keep it going and it kind of goes like this and it doesn't really work. <laughs> now, can you pedal your bike with one foot? Maybe, kind of, not really. You really can't go anywhere, right? And so what he says is spiritual pedaling to generate light. If you want to get out of the darkness and tap into the power of Jesus Christ and have light in your life, you need to pedal with both feet. You can't have one foot on the bike and one foot in Babylon, right? It can't be like, yeah, I'll go to church on Sundays and then I'm going to go to a Friday night party, right? I'll go to church on Sundays, I'll pass a sacrament, and then I'm going to go watch bad movies and break the word of wisdom with my friends, right? Break the law of chastity. It doesn't work like that. You're not going to have light in your life if that's what you're doing. We need to get both of those feet pedaling, keeping the commandments, living the standards of the church, and then you will generate light. And you can be an amazing force for good in this world when you generate that light and when you get to be the instrument in God's hands and reflect the light of Jesus Christ and serve as a lighthouse for other people. So those are the messages that I got today out of Helaman 5 and the talk out of darkness into marvelous light by Robert D. Hales. And I encourage you to read this chapter on your own. And do you have any additional insights that you can share with me? I would love to learn from you. Please comment and let me know. And what do you think about this talk? Let me know. Are there any stories how this applies to you? Share this video with your friends. And I look forward to giving you, the teens of the church, more messages. Thanks for joining me, guys.